And welcome one, welcome all. This is the Appraiser Coach Podcast. My name is Dustin Harris. I want to welcome each of you out. Today we are sponsored by Data Master. Data Master right now offering a 15-day free trial. You can go to datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach. That's datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach. I think I said 15-day. It's an actual 14-day. I'll bet you they'd give you an extra day if you ask, though. They're a good company like that. We're also sponsored by Alamode, which does give you a 15-day free trial at alamode.com slash free trial. That's alamode.com slash free trial. They also have a 10-year price guarantee right now at $349 per year, folks. That is a steal. Check it out. Go to alamode.com slash free trial or 1-800-ALAMODE. We are also sponsored by Working RE Magazine, where I go quite frequently to find out what's going on in the appraisal profession. I hope you do as well. Great information found at workingre.com. You get the print version. When was the last time you went to your computer and typed in Working RE? Dot com. Well, folks, as I uh, mentioned, uh, we've got a great show for you today. I'm super excited to have on the show again somebody who has been here before. His name is Tim Anderson. He was on episode number 145, uh, Why Appraisers Should Be Involved Politically. Had lots of downloads for that particular episode. I hope you go to that episode and listen to it if you have not already. But I want to welcome back to the program on a different subject, Mr. Tim Anderson. Dustin, thank you. How are you and your family doing? Wonderful, wonderful, and uh, appreciate you checking in on me and my family. That, uh, as you know, my family is very, very important to me. And uh, Tim and I uh, go back uh, to uh, uh, we, we've we've uh, rubbed shoulders in more than than one venue. And I appreciate Tim being on the show. He is uh, an excellent appraiser. He's been practicing since 1986. Uh, he says eventually, if he practices enough, he may get it right. I have a feeling he's probably got it right already. Uh, in 1990, he was the former Society of Real Estate Appraisers awarded him the SRPA designation. What is that, uh, Tim? What does that mean? It's, that's uh, it. It originally meant a senior real property appraiser, but there have been other names attached to it of uh, uh, far less repute. <laughs> We'll, we'll just leave it at Senior Residential Property Appraiser. In 1997, the Appraisal Institute awarded him the MIA designation. Congratulations on that. Uh, both of these were likely due to his administrative snafus, he says. Um, the, uh, um, the AI has uh, requested Tim return both designations. Okay, I can't even read this, Tim. <laughs> he gives me this bio that I know is set in tongue-in-cheek. Let's just put it this way. Uh, he, is, uh, he is the uh, husband to Debbie. Um, and uh, he lives in Florida, and uh, they love their children and their grandchildren. That's the most important thing anyway, right, Tim? You betcha. That's great. Thank you, Dustin. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, I wanted to have Tim back on uh, to talk about uh, something that's going on uh, in our profession, a kind of a direction that our profession seems to be heading. Uh, but let's start uh, with the, the basic foundations. Uh, uh, Tim, Fanny says uh, that there are 40 thousand active appraisers. I think that's a surprise to most appraisers. 40,000 active appraisers. What that basically means is uh, these are appraisers who have an active number uh, with the CU um, coming out here a couple of years ago. They started keeping track of appraisers by their unique number, and there are about 40,000 active appraisers right now. Uh, so let's just assume for purposes of today that this is correct. Uh, Tim, how many of those do you believe are, are form fillers versus actual appraisers? And I think everybody knows what I mean by form fillers. Well, it's going to depend on when they take their morning naps, uh, Dustin, <laughs> basically. Uh, uh, from a standpoint of actual appraisers versus form fillers, uh, there are lots of form fillers. And one of the areas in appraising that concerns me, as well as a lot of other people, is that our training of appraisers, uh, especially at the at the beginning levels, concentrates on what to put in a box or what to put in a line on one of the 800 more or less uh, blank fields there are in the Fannie right. Mae appraisal report. And while that is without question necessary, I mean, we, we have to know what goes in there, but our training does not tell us why it goes in there. It merely tells us that it goes in there. Right. So we're talking about, Dustin, uh, our education lacks uh, an orientation toward what's called uh, critical thinking as well as systemic thinking. And critical thinking is you don't depend on someone or something else for your conclusions. You depend on your own analyses. Right. 
Now, all too often, appraisers are willing, for example, to uh, merely uh, tran- transcribe MLS data from the MLS into the report. Well, well, it maybe it's right, maybe it isn't. I think we all realize that in the long run, the MLS is notoriously, oh, how shall we say this? Uh, loose. Spot on. Uh, <laughs> well, don't we wish? Uh, notoriously loose in its interpretation of the truth. So when we say, well, the MLS said there were 1,200 square feet, so I put 1,200 square feet, well, okay. But the point is, Standard Rule 2-3 says that every statement of fact in the appraisal report is true and correct. Mm -hmm. Well, if we just blindly take something out of MLS, we have no way of knowing if it's true and correct. And to use something that isn't true and correct is a serious ethics violation. Okay, so let's let's talk about what you see going on in the marketplace. Then I, I assume maybe you do some peer reviews or have an opportunity to, um, you know, look at other reports or, or maybe talk to appraisers across the nation. What would be your overall judgment on the temperature of appraisers across the nation? In other words, how many of them uh, do you think are are in some serious trouble with regard to their practices? Uh, Dustin, uh, statistically speaking, a- any given appraiser in any given year has about a 3% chance of finding him or herself on the wrong end of a letter from the state appraisal mm-hmm. board. Sure, uh, Those are relatively low odds. However, and there's always a however, however, the issue is that, appra- that the appraisal, the business of appraising is cumulative. Therefore, if you're in business for 30 years, and a lot of us have been in business for 30 years, now you're looking at somewhere around a 90% chance of somewhere along that line, you're going to find yourself on the wrong end of a, of a letter from the state appraisal board. And while the states are limited somewhat because of budgetary constraints, they will look at an appraisal report, and if it is faulty, they will go after the appraiser. It's that simple. And unfortunately, way too many appraisers write way too many reports in which they are opening opening themselves up to that liability. Gotcha. Okay. So let's uh, let's step back for just a second. I'm going to give a little background on this next question. Um, you, my listeners know that I took a lot of heat uh, in the comments section of a recent episode. Uh, so the episode was a day in the life of Dustin Harris, and basically the gist of that episode was to help paint a picture. Uh, that, you know, the way that appraisers are doing it across the nation, when I say appraisers, I mean probably the majority of appraisers are doing it across the nation, may be fine, may be good, may be well, uh, but it's not the only way of doing things. And I kind of laid out some uh, of a sentiment of what I do in my business, which I'll admit is is much different than what most appraisers do. Uh, What I typically see is that once I lay something out like that, because it is different, than what other appraisers are doing. They somehow equate different to being wrong. And so I, I took a lot of flack on that. I followed up with a uh, with another episode, uh, basically in response to some of the comments that came across. Uh, I set it up that way because what I am seeing, Tim, is sometimes we get an attitude, uh, appraisers, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, I get an attitude that that my way of doing it is the right way of doing it. And sometimes we say to ourselves, if I don't do it myself, then it doesn't get done correctly. In other words, if I if I want something done right, you know, you've heard the old adage, I've got to do it myself. What I have found in my business is that by delegating, by setting up my business model a little bit differently, utilizing technology, some of these other tools that are at our disposal, if set up correctly, actually improves the quality of the report. Stick with me, here's why. Um, I find that from start to finish, there's quite a few things that have to be done on every appraisal report. Um, Some of those things I put in the category of tier one, some I put in the category of tier two, and some I put in the category of tier three. Now, I'm gonna do a mini-sode very soon on these tiers and talk a little bit about what that means and what it should mean. But basically, the gist of it is tier one is stuff that can be done by pretty much anybody with minimal training, answering phones, uh, pulling up a, a you know a plat map, um, gathering some some uh, you know very basic tax information. 
those kind of things can be done by tier one level employees. Tier two takes a little bit more training and tier three is an appraiser. Tier three is more, as you talked about, the analytical side of things. Uh, so the question that I want to go to basically is after, after a long setup, and I apologize for that, what are your thoughts on um, an appraiser focusing on appraisal and being able to delegate some of these other things so that we don't get so bogged down by running our business and some of the more minuscule tasks that we forgot and we forget that we're appraisers. Dustin, I had a doctor's appointment this morning. I had my knee replaced in uh, January. And of course, every so often I have to see the orthopedic surgeon. So I went into the doctor this morning and in the 40 minutes I was there, I saw an x-ray technician. I saw a nurse. I saw a, a physician's assistant and then finally, for about three minutes, I got to see the doctor. Right. And the point I'm trying to make is, why should the doctor uh, help me with x-rays? You know, why, why should the doctor take my blood pressure? Uh, why, why should the doctor take my temperature? The doctor shouldn't. The doctor knows too much. He's too well trained. The doctor's a healer. The other people are technicians. Right. And I'm not denigrating technicians. That's not the point. I'm saying the doctor has learned the lesson that you've got to delegate. All right. If you're going to hire somebody to answer the phone, then hire somebody to answer the phone. If you're going to hire a researcher, then hire a researcher or get an app that gets it done. Or uh, there are various uh, companies out there that will happily type your reports for you. Sure. And if you're if you're satisfied with that, if that works for you, then that's what you ought to be doing. Because if you're if you are paying yourself ten dollars an hour to type a report, when you could be earning seventy five dollars an hour doing an appraisal, right. you're not. And <laughs> okay. you've got. You've got, and, and, and as you know, uh, does and I tend to be very, you know, quiet and reserved and not <laughs> yeah. say what yeah, I it's think. Yeah, it's hard um, to pry stuff out of you. Yeah, it is. So uh, you've got to, you, you know, we're in business. Yes, we're appraisers, but we're in business. And we're in business to make money. And, yeah, we want to care for our clients. Yeah, but we want to care for us first. Right, right. So whatever, you know, you got to make money. And let's face it, appraisal fees are relatively limited. Yeah. So you've got to do as much appraisal work as you possibly can and as little of the other, pardon me, crap, as you can possibly get away with. Right. Okay. Good, good, good. So we're on the same page there. Let's talk, uh, let's talk about clients for just a second because one of the, th the unintended consequences I see with appraisers um, is that we start to work for clients that are the lowest common denominator. Thus, we in turn start to give the lowest common denominator report. Stick with me. This is what I mean by that. Uh, an appraiser might be a very good appraiser, might be trained well, might have the education needed, uh, might have a great mentor. The experience that he or she has leading up to getting their, their license may be excellent. They get out on their own. They start doing their own thing. Um, they find very quickly that you know finding good clients uh, might be challenging, might be difficult, might take some time. So they start to settle, if you will, uh, for maybe some other types of clients. Um, you know, I'm a big advocate of of putting clients in three categories. That would be category A. Uh, the A clients are you know exactly what you would think they would be. Just excellent clients. They pay on time. They you know very few steps. Um, they, they understand appraisal and they understand what you're trying to accomplish. Then you've got the B clients that, you know, maybe they've got most of those um, issues going on, but they might have a problem here or there. Maybe they're slow to pay. You know, maybe they might have a few more steps than, than regular. Maybe they pay a little bit less uh, than, than somebody else might pay, but they're still within the acceptable customary, customary and reasonable range for your particular business. And then you've got the why clients. The why clients, I you know, I always say, or you know, why stands for why the hell am I working for you, clients? And sometimes I think we as appraisers need to step back and decide who we are working for and why we're working for those people. But where I'm going with this um, with this process, Tim, and and the question that I have for you is, do you see a relationship to the quality of appraisal based on the quality of the client that we might take on? Uh, Dustin, without question, although it's unfortunate because there really shouldn't be any significant difference in quality. There could be a difference in how much work you go to, scope of work, but you, whatever report you produce should be a quality report. But right. yes, unfortunately, chances are you're going to pamper the A's and you're going to look at the way, look at ways not to take the phone calls from the C's. Uh, that's just human nature. And, uh, 
uh, as despicable as that may sound, that's, that's probably the way things are. Right. But yet the issue is not so much to have a lot of C clients, it's to have a lot of you know, B or A clients. Right. And I'm a great one for sitting down at the end of every year, be it the, phys- phys- be it the calendar year or the fiscal year, and saying, okay, who am I going to fire? Yeah. And firing, you know, five AMCs or five lenders or five brokers or whatever who are just uh, too much of a pain in the tuckus to deal with. <laughs> Is that a fiscal and, term? Uh, that, <laughs> yeah, pain in the tuckus. Yeah, right. that's a that's a that, that's a that's a southern word. Okay, okay, and, we'll um, go with it. Actually, it isn't, but I'm not going to translate what it means. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but you know, well, obviously, you know, we all have to work for a living, and working for a living is you know more or less miserable most of the time. It doesn't need to be any more miserable than it has to be, which means every so often you're going to have to fire a lousy client, and many appraisers say, well then I'll have to get another client. Yeah. <laughs> and the problem is, exactly. get another yeah. client. Yeah. What's the problem? You know, you spend the, that, that's why you go to Kiwanis meetings. That's why you go to Rotary meetings. That's why you go to uh, church or synagogue. That's why you go to uh, the appraisal summit and expo every year, uh, to meet other appraisers, to meet potential clients and to see if you want to deal with them. Yep. Yep. Great, great, great point. So let's get to the, uh, the meat. Uh, really why I wanted to have you on today is talking about, uh, training, talking about qualifications, talking about appraisers. We've been talking so far a little bit, I think, about you know sometimes how we slip back into um, the the primal mode of of uh, surviving, and sometimes we forget and and allow our quality to go by the wayside. I hope we're not doing that on a regular basis, but I fear that maybe we are. Let's start from the basis, though. Let's talk about education. Uh, Tim, in your opinion, are appraisers being trained right? No. <laughs> Okay, next question. Okay, come on. Expand. <laughs> <laughs> no, appraisers, appraisers are not being trained right. Uh, I call it the, uh, uh, the the Gomer and Goober Temporary Internet Academy of Small Engine Repair, Bass Fishing, and Real Estate Appraisal. Wow, wow and, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, appraisers are, the education uh, we receive is adequate for filling out Fannie Mae forms, but it's not adequate for critical thinking. It's not adequate for systemic thinking. And uh, Dustin, you're going to you're going to get folks jumping up and down on you and me by extension over my next uh, statement. But I think the Appraisal Foundation really screwed the pooch when it did not require appraisers to have college degrees. Now I know a lot of people don't like that, and I understand it. The question is. You know, where is it written that a college degree makes me a better appraiser? Right. Well, where is it written that that, that uh, not having one makes you a better appraiser? Okay, good so point. So I, I think appraisers are not uh, being properly trained. And in today's age, especially with technology, which I feel appraisers have not kept up with, well, of course, it's also possible that, uh, that technology has not looked at us as a, a particularly uh, lucrative market. But one of the areas in which I see appraisers are not well-trained is in the area of analysis of large amounts of data. And yes, that is a euphemism for regression analysis and AVMs. And while a lot of appraisers consider regression analysis and AVMs the equivalent roughly of a cockroach on an ice cream cone, uh, that is about the only way we are going to be able to um, analyze a great deal of data quickly and I think everybody will agree with me that one of the mantras of the mortgage lending industry is faster, 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 right. faster, faster. Well, and we're not speeding up unless we cut corners, and we can't cut corners. So we we I recently attended um, Fannie Mae's presentation at the Val Expo, and I was I wouldn't say blown away because I knew they had this info, info but the the things that they were able to derive from big data, if you will, uh, was pretty amazing. Uh, when you start to deal with big numbers, and when I say big numbers, I'm not talking about uh, you know numbers with a lot of zeros behind them. I'm talking about a great quantity of numbers. Um, one of the comments that was made, and I can't remember if it was uh, the guy at Fannie or not uh, that was making the presentation, uh, Zach. Um, his name slips my mind right now, but uh, um, he was making a presentation at the at the Val Expo, um, and he I don't remember if it was him or someone else that said it, 
Um, but the gist of it was basically every property in the United States in one sense or another is mapped by Fannie Mae, whether it was used as a comp, whether it's used as an appraisal. You know, since they started collecting this data, they are able to tell a lot about a single property because they have the data uh, available. What does that do to us as appraisers, Tim? Where does that put us knowing that that big data is out there? Well, it puts us in, uh, it, in one sense, Dustin, it puts us at a disadvantage because we do not have access to Fannie Mae's database despite the fact that we populated it. However, those databases exist elsewhere. CoreLogic, and, and I'm not selling CoreLogic, I'm just making a, a, a comment here, sure. uh, has the equivalent database, and it's available for purchase. Now, is it something that the typical appraiser him or herself could buy? No, it's not. But uh, the the point is, there are what I call mirror databases out there to which appraisers can uh, have access. As a result, appraisers could amass, or excuse me, appraisers could analyze the same amount of data if they had the software to do it. And the software exists. And the best part about it is the software is relatively inexpensive. Right. If you already have Excel on your computer, it's free. Or you can, uh, your friend Josh Wallet uh, has a, a program. Uh, uh, Dave Braun out of Tennessee has a great program. There's a program called um, Minitab. And again, I'm not selling anything uh, here. I get nothing from any of these companies. The point <laughs> is, I'm recommending them. And it shows you my business acumen, doesn't it? <laughs> but the, the, the point is, appraisers have got to come into the 21st century. The days of three, three comps on a form are dead. And if, unless we come into the 21st century from a standpoint of technology, from a standpoint of big data, from a standpoint of analytics, from a standpoint of using those analytics as a tool, which is all they are, uh, using a, a, those analytics as a tool, we are going to find ourselves as useless and outmoded as buggy whip makers. Okay, perfect. I want to I want to pause there for just a second because I want to come back to him and talk about how we make ourselves relevant again because the 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 landscape is changing. You would be a fool not to recognize it and I think appraisers could use some advice from someone like yourself on where we need to go moving forward with all of this big data. But speaking of data, let's talk about Data Master. Data Master takes data and transfers it directly into your appraisal report. Folks, I know that doesn't sound like a big deal. It is is a big deal. If you're talking about time, and let's face it, folks, everything we do is about time and money, and everything we do translates into money. The time we spend is money out of our pocket unless we can do it quicker and better. Data Master does that for us. It will save you between 30 and 60 minutes per report. Why? Because you don't have to sit there and type word for word, line for line from your MLS into your appraisal software. Folks, it does that and so much more. Check them out right now for 14 days. You can try them free. Datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach. It's kind of long, so write it down. Datamasterfreetrial.com slash coach. Speaking of a free trial, have you tried a la mode? Folks, if you're using another appraisal software, great. They are great. Software across the country is great. I know the individuals at the heads of each of these software companies, they're good people. They care about appraisers. But there is a reason that Ola Mode is the leader in appraisal software. They've been the leader for years and years and years. They've been doing this for over 30 years, folks. Beat that. Uh, I've been using them for over 20 years, and you need to be using them as well. Try them for 15 days free, and then once you jump on board, you'll want to jump on board, and then you can lock in your price at $349 per year for the next decade. 10 years, a price guarantee at $349 per year. That's the type of company that Alamode is. Check them out again, alamode.com slash free trial. That's alamode.com slash free trial. Or you can call them at 800 Alamode. Speaking of data, speaking of information, speaking of being up on what's going on, folks, Working RE comes out every quarter with their print magazine, and I love it. I take it with me on the airplane. I read it from front to back. But if I want to know about what's going on in between those quarterly reports, I jump on WorkingRE.com. WorkingRE is concerned about appraisers. They're concerned about the profession. They let you know what's going on almost before it's happening. That's what WorkingRE is. Think about it this way. It's your cable news network for appraisers. If you want to know what's going on in your profession, check them out. Go to WorkingRE.com. That's WorkingRE, as in WorkingRealEstate.com. 
And welcome back, folks. Dustin Harris here, the host of the Appraiser Coach Podcast. And on the other end of the line is a good friend of mine, Mr. Tim Anderson uh, from Florida. Welcome back, uh, Mr. Anderson. Dustin, thank you. Glad to be here. Glad to be back. Pleasure always to have you. You have uh, euphemisms that uh, just keep me rolling in the aisles, so I appreciate that. Keep them coming. Uh, we've been talking about big data today a little bit. We've been talking, you know, really kind of a wide range of topics today, talking about, you know, uh, appraisal training, qualifications, uh, where we're at as a, as a profession, where we need to do, you know, where we need to be moving forward. What we've established, I think, Tim, is that appraisers sometimes, not always, but some times we are under educated we're under experienced we are we become form fillers uh we start this process of forgetting that we are professionals uh add to that mix that big data is here uh, whether we like it or not that data is available um, people are checking our work again sometimes i think that's uh, um, a little fruitless on their side because they don't understand the whole picture but the reality is they're utilizing that data. They're coming back. They're asking questions. You said this, but our data says that. Um, Tim, let's talk about moving forward. As a profession and individual appraisers, uh, let's talk about where we need to be with this data. What do we need to do to incorporate this moving forward? Well, we all need to be on the beach where the sun is shining and the ocean is cresting comfortably and and perhaps fishing. That's where we all need to be. Now, since we can't all be there all, all the time, <laughs> let's talk about some other stuff. Okay. Fair I enough. Live in, I, I live in Florida. I live in Florida, Dustin, and you live in Idaho. The Rocky Mountains. Oh, yeah. And, and I, I wasn't going to publicize that. And I'm looking out on my patio, and it's 82 degrees and the sun's shining. Oh, so I've got to give you a little bit of a hard time. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Dustin, um, from a standpoint, okay, let's go back to education. I, appraisers need to be better educated. Um, I do a lot of teaching, and uh, I, I love it's something that I just dearly love to do. And uh, I teach uh, USPAP. I teach classes that I've written. I teach classes. I teach classes that other instructors have written. And I find out that there are a whole lot of appraisers out there who are looking to further their education, to further their training. They want to do a better job. They want. They they don't want to hear from clients. You know, other than when the checks arrive. Uh, they don't want, you know, silly stipulations. Excuse me, I was going to say silly-ass stipulations, but I can't say that on your <laughs> yeah, program. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I'm uh, glad you corrected that. Uh, the, uh, censor They me. don't want silly stipulations. Yeah, censor that. They don't want silly stipulations. They want to get it done right. They want to do it right the first time. Sure. I've, I've never met anybody who's in trouble with the state who said, yeah, I woke up on a Thursday morning and decided to mess up an appraisal, so the state had come after me. You know, it never <laughs> happens. They, said, they say, you know, I'm trying to do a good job. Right. Okay. So the point is, part of, that is part, part of that is education. Part of that is due diligence. And Dustin, I will bet you that if you or any of your listeners go back to your educational notes, which I'm sure we have all kept, Oh, and sure. look under due diligence, you won't find anything because you never covered it. <laughs> okay, good. And uh, th th that's a problem. Uh, we don't know exactly what it is we're supposed to do. Well, okay, so l let's talk about what we need to do then. So with this big data, um, you know, the word regression comes to mind. Um, and I know that's just one tool of many. But let's talk about regression for just a minute. Uh, do you see appraisers using regression, Tim? Uh, right now, no, I do not, although, I must confess, I see more appraisers looking at it a lot more favorably. If you go to Standard Rule 1-4, it says that the appraiser has got to uh, gather, verify, and analyze all of the information necessary for credible assignment results, and I hope that's a direct quote. But the point is all. Well, if you're doing three, if you're doing three comps on a grid, you're not analyzing all the relevant data. Now, there may only be 10 sales where you are, and in that case, regression analysis probably isn't going to do you a whole lot of good. But let's face it, most appraisers live in major metropolitan areas. Hmm. Uh, well, except for Idaho, which is, you know, <laughs> still basically back in the Stone Age. Yeah. <laughs> and we're the exception. My parents, my parents were born in Idaho, so anyway, I have a deep love for it. Uh, the point is, most of us live in major metropolitan areas, and the data exists. Uh, be it from MLS or from county records or from private data suppliers. They can be downloaded. They can be regressed. Literally, it, it, the, the, the most time-consuming thing you'll have to do is get it into an Excel spreadsheet. Once you get it into an Excel spreadsheet, it's instantaneous. So 
once you get the Excel spreadsheet done, it's a matter of pressing a couple of buttons and waiting for the printout. Then you have to know what the printout means. But the point is, you can get one indication of value, and that's all it is, an indication of value, from regression analysis in an amazingly short period of time, a lot less time than it'll take you to do the cost approach, uh, for example. And then if you do all three approaches, you've got cost, sales, uh, income, and then regression analysis on which to base your final value opinion. And the point is, if your final value opinion is based on well-analyzed, solid data, your final value opinion is on solid ground. If your final value opinion is uh, based on crap, you got a crap value opinion. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, what if, what if I like crap value opinions, though? Well, that's your choice. It's called scope of work. <laughs> it's, called, it's called, do you want to be in business tomorrow, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... As we as we look at, at regression, Tim, and I think I think it's becoming more and more. Well, like you said, appraisers are looking more favorably upon it, and I think one of the reasons that they're looking more favorably on it is they can also see the financial incentive of doing it. Uh, that maybe that shouldn't be their primary motivation, but let's face it: there's more and more clients that are looking to um, have you support your adjustments, have you support your reconciliation, and and and. Um, Regression is one way, as you mentioned, one way, one tool in that toolbox of doing that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the misuse of regression. Uh, what do you see uh, amongst appraisers where m maybe they're trying to use regression, but they are not doing it correctly? What would you What would you caution them on? Okay, I was I was recently speaking with Craig Morley. Craig used to be the chairman of the Utah uh, State Appraisal Board. Yeah, great guy. And he was talking. Yeah, he is. And he was talking about. Uh, there are appraisers out there using regression analysis when they when they don't know what it is, they don't know what it means, and they don't know what the output means. Okay. So, yes, it, it takes a little while to learn what it is, and uh, there are people out there who will be happy to explain that to you. Uh, so that's not a real problem. And then there are other technical problems. The biggest one is probably called collinearity, and it's where the appraiser is counting the same thing twice. In other words, the appraiser makes both a bedroom count adjustment as well as a size adjustment. Right, right. Usually they're mutually exclusive, and if the appraiser doesn't know what he or she is doing, that's possible in regression analysis, and you just have to learn how to overcome that. It's not, not terribly difficult. It could be either, done either mathematically or intuitively. So a couple of weeks ago, I put up an episode. I think the title of it was uh, Computer Generated Incompetence. The purpose of that episode was to remind appraisers that we should not be so reliant upon our computers that we forget that we're appraisers. The example I gave on that episode yeah. is the cost approach. Uh, you know, sometimes we allow our software to do the cost approach for us, uh, instead of actually understanding what is actually going on. In other words, when was the last time we went back to basics and realized that you have to subtract out the, um, the, the lot value before you make the depreciation adjustment and then add it back in at the end to get the final value? I, we allow the computer to do it for us, and we forget that there's a process there, and we forget to double-check things. Uh, your suggestion as far as regression goes, let's say I'm an appraiser, that uh, understands the need of, re of, of regression going forward. Uh, I don't live in Idaho, so there is some data out there, uh, and I want to utilize regression. What would be your suggestion on moving forward? Um, forget it all entirely? You know, hey, I don't understand it, so I, therefore I can't use it? Or what would you suggest? Well, that's certainly you know one alternative. It's the alternative I hope appraisers wouldn't choose, but it's one. Uh, basically, and again, I'm not trying to sell Josh Wallet's program. Josh's a heck of a nice guy. But he's got eight or ten short videos on YouTube that explain what it is and how it works. And I would suggest that uh, uh, you watch them. And then through uh, your website, uh, there are, what, two hour and a half uh, videos yeah. available on regression? I would uh, suggest that the appraisers watch those and learn what the printouts mean so that when you get the results, you can say, oh, this has got a really low p value right. and what a really low p value means or this one has got a, a, a really high uh, z score and what a z score means not difficult i mean there's concepts you can master 30 seconds because you're not mastering the math you're just mastering the concepts it's real simple and once you learn what things like that are uh, your co correlation coefficient etc once you learn what those are and what it is they do 
then all of a sudden uh, appraising doesn't necessarily become a lot easier, but it becomes faster, and the quality of the work becomes better. Tim, I appreciate you being on today. I think these are great things that we need to be looking at. The world is changing, appraisers. Uh, you know, I know some would rather sit in their appraisal cave and and complain about the direction that the industry is going. There's others of us that see the writing on the wall. We understand the need for this. And regardless of which direction the profession is going, regression and some of these other tools are things we need to understand anyway. This is going back to basics, going back to crossing our T's and dotting our I's. Uh, Tim Anderson's been on, on with us from Florida. Tim, any uh, parting words for appraisers? Any uh, um, any shout outs um, to, uh, to to what appraisers should you think? Suggestions, maybe maybe uh, um, tips or tricks that to, you would love to give us uh, that we need to to have moving forward. Uh, Dustin, you know we uh, you and I uh, met again briefly at the last appraisal summit next fall, and I had a teaching gig and I had to leave early. But uh, whether you go to uh, the uh, 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 whether you go to the Summit Next Fall or the Institute Summit or Joan Trice's Summit, the point is go yeah. at least once a year. Learn what's going on. Learn from the experts. Uh, learn where the future is and is going. Uh, otherwise, again, I'm going to invoke the uh, the buggy whip analogy. We're going to be as useless and as unemployed as buggy whip makers. Tim Anderson from Florida, thank you for joining us, my friend. It's a pleasure, Dustin. I appreciate it. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank you, my friend. And uh, hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Uh, folks, I think this is important data. This is important information to know. Uh, to know the direction of our industry is one thing. What you, as an appraiser, will do about that is something quite different. That's a business decision that you need to make. But I would highly encourage that you know what's going on. You know about big data. You know about training. You know about regression. You know about these things. And you, you start to utilize them. Folks, uh, Tim mentioned uh, several times a uh, a webinar that is on my website. You can go to theappraisercoach.com. I did it with Josh Wallet. Um, you know, I don't know every appraiser across the nation, but of the appraisers that I know, this guy knows regression inside and out. Uh, he did a two-part webinar with us doing regression, not selling his product, by the way, doesn't even mention his product on there. Uh, he's simply showing how to do regression and he uses it with Excel only. No program, no special um, uh, algorithms. He takes basic data from the MLS and and spits out incredible numbers that will be very useful in your appraisals. If you're interested in that, it's a two-part webinar, as Tim mentioned. Part one is why regression? Uh, do we need it? Do we really need to do it? And part two, how to do real regression using simple Excel techniques. 59 bucks, folks, gets you both uh, webinars, both about 90 minutes apiece, and they are excellent. Again, thanks for Tim uh, for joining us, and folks, thank you each and every one of you for listening, and we will catch you next time here on the Appraiser Coach Podcast. Thank you.